like the nucleus is there going, good to see you back. Doesn't recognize that it's exogenous or foreign or synthetic. It's just like, oh, DNA, come on in. Like the, the nucleus is like, come on in, come on on. And now even in the absence of the SV40 enhancer, yeah. dividing cells open the nuclear membrane for a period of time before and then close before they divide. While that nuclear membrane's open, any other fragments of DNA that don't have, for instance, the SV40 enhancer, as soon as the membrane opens, that part, the nucleus, while it's open, goes, oh, look, some other DNA, quick, come in before we close, come in before we close. Like, it's just, DNA is like a magnet to DNA. It just, they like to hang out, right? They just like to hang out. So the efficiency, in other words, of this even fragmented DNA to gain access into the nucleus is just off the charts. It's off the charts. And this is very proper and very clear calculations on this. Indeed, one of the molecular PhDs uh, who we've been working with, who's written the expert report for our GMO proceedings against Pfizer and Moderna and provided supporting expert evidence uh, for the purposes of the criminal prosecutions with the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, has been able to show the established scientific literature that we're talking about up to uh, 10 to up to 20 percent um, integration. So what? It's already understood that this stuff's going straight into the nucleus, but once it's in there, what's the next thing? The next part of the conversation, obviously, is what's it doing to the DNA, our natural chromosomes? But by, by recent studies, up to 10 to 20% of what gets into the nucleus is being integrated. Integrated. It becomes part okay. of the genome of that cell. That's right. And so that's a integration of synthetic DNA into our natural chromosomal DNA. Now, to be clear, chromosomal DNA is always undergoing changes, and that's natural. That's how we adapt to what the body says. We need to change to adapt to ward off these new threats and these new threats, okay? That's called mutagenesis. It's been going on forever in all species. It's a natural part of evolution. But when, on the other hand, you introduce a foreign, let alone a synthetic DNA, and it integrates into our genome, not via any natural process whatsoever. That's called transgenesis, transgenesis. And that's what our chromosomes aren't ready for. But they're ready to undergo natural mutations because that's the natural cycle of things. But when our DNA is... They don't even know, our DNA doesn't even know that it's been force fed effectively a synthetic DNA. And then it's in there, it's like, oh, hold on. You're upsetting the apple cart, mate. This new one's upsetting the apple cart. But it's too late. Once it's integrated, it's integrated. It's not like our chromosomes can say, oh, get out of here. No, man, you, 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 you're upsetting the operations. Once it's in, it's locked in. So with a, a up, you know, 10 to 20% integration rate, and then you take multiple shots of this stuff, well, then your integration rate just compounds, doesn't it? I mean, can we just look at the maps there? They did that off just studies of single applications or whatever they were working out that integration rate rib. But we're talking about multiple doses of this stuff, which was so aggressively, aggressively, aggressively pushed on nations everywhere under fear of, you know, you can't go and see granny, you can't go to your job. Um, you know all the all the oppression. Well, you, might ki- you might kill Granny if you don't get it. Yeah, um, but you know, here we are. We've got this situation where extraordinary contamination. Now, the contamination wasn't just confirmed by Kevin McKernan. Let's be very clear about that. He was the first one to do it. Um, then another another PhD out of the US, which was um, a Buckholz. Buckholz. Um, he sort of threw down the glove and says, oh, I don't believe this, and went into his lab and then walked out just aghast. Uh, it's like, um, holy crap, it's uh, actually worse than Kevin initially said uh, because he identified that that step of um, the DNA is where it seeks to fragment the plasmid DNA into little pieces is actually really efficient. And so we've got 
multiple instead of one big plasmid contained yeah. circular DNA, it's broken up into multiple pieces. Yeah. And Buckholtz said, you've just increased your chances of integration because there are multiple fragments of DNA now. And so if you throw multiple fragments at any one particular cell, you're going to exponentially increase the chances of an integration event. And so he's freaking out to the point now that he's conducting um, various studies of people who become seriously ill after taking these drugs to ascertain by taking various biopsies around, um, you know, from people's bodies, um, if he can identify integration events as having been the cause of these people's illnesses. It's a very proper and sensible pathway to go down. Mm -hmm. Now, Bockholz is not the only one. Um, Koning in Canada confirmed the same DNA contamination and levels of DNA contamination. The Dutch also did the same thing and Kernan got hold of their data and was able to verify their data. In Japan, I know the people who smuggled out vials from Japan and got them over uh, into US labs and they've confirmed the same levels of contamination. And then there's David Speecher, who together with uh, Kevin McKernan and Jessica Rose uh, sampled, what was it, 27 vials up in Canada and across all of those vials, we've got the same contamination. And where it's worse is that in early, Kevin raised, you know, sent up the flare in, in, in February of 2023 and made it very public. Like Pfizer and Moderna know exactly who Kevin McKernan is because he was mm. such a leader on the Human Genome Project. Mm. They With use... Where, a, Francis Collins was as well. I don't know. He's got that's right. Well, he was the boss. He was the boss of yeah. the Human Genome project mm. and and indeed Pfizer and Moderna they use instruments that were that were created by essentially the work of Kevin McKernan um, when it comes to DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing and so on mm. so when when Kevin puts up a signal flare they saw it but they can continue to create their new bivalent um, vac what they call yeah. vaccines new bivalents they Kevin and David Speecher and, and Jessica Rose, Dr. Jessica Rose, tested the, the, the very latest versions, uh, including the bivalent, and they were found to be more contaminated. In other words, he's given them a heads up, and they look at, they, nine months later, with the latest product coming off the manufacturing line, they didn't go and fix their manufacturing to get rid of this contamination or even try and reduce it, the product coming out worse, more adulterated. It's and of like, course, in the, in the original trials, the Pfizer trials, for example, the um, vaccine, in inverted commas, that was used was, was produced by a completely different manufacturing process. Oh, yeah, the bait and switch, the bait and the, switch. The, the vast, I mean, we, we talked about this with Josh uh, Getzko. Yes. Uh, it, 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 in the trials originally, it was... Um, it was basically a PCR type method to, 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 to make to make it. And That's right. The vast majority of the vaccine used in the trials was um, was this method. And then for the manufacturing, they use a completely different method with the DNA contamination. It's just. Yeah. And and so and you know how to get away with that. Yeah. The, 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 the process one, which was process, was not process made, two, yeah. yeah, which was not made with plasma DNA with bacteria. Um, with, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, they directly through um, <clears throat> in vitro transcription mm. created immediately the mod RNA without any yeah. DNA as a step. And so that was yeah. very clean, a very clean product. And they gave that to uh, 46,000 people, or there was the control, 22,000 received it, and 22,000 was the control. And we now know well, that, that we, we, we also, we're also, um, we also talked to, um, uh, researcher in the States, his name, I just can't remember his name now, I can see his face, um, who found out about one in 800 people had side effects. Oh, that's uh, Freeman. That's Freeman. For, yeah, yeah Ed, Ed, that's it. Yeah, Ed Freeman. Well, yeah. Freeman. And he used to be part of one of the one of the major journals. He used to be that, a that, former. That, that, that's right. Very thorough piece of work. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Reanalysis of the Pfizer and Moderna data and yeah, found yeah. one in 800 people suffering adverse events. Now, yeah. back in the day, it, you, the, you couldn't 
get anything through a trial if, if it if it uh, had a higher number than one and say a hundred thousand yeah. anything lower well then that was immediately black boxed as peter mcculloch would say yeah. and if there was any deaths to follow then the product had to be pulled well uh, dr uh, um, uh, jayanthi uh, part of the daily cloud crew working with um dr naomi wolf and amy kelly uh, they found those additional deaths which were not included by pfizer even though the deaths occurred before the reporting cutoff date. So Pfizer mucked around with all their data and had they been clean with their data, well, the product would never have been approved. But as you mentioned, they go, they, they created the theater of process one, everyone receiving this clean product, mm -hmm. which still created enormous numbers yeah, of adverse enough. events yeah. and deaths. And then at the last moment, they said, oh, but we, if we're going to deploy this on a population or indeed global basis, we need to use a different upscale manufacturing process for the volumes in, involved. Um, that's process two. We'll test that, uh, but we'll only test it on 250 people. That's right, yeah. And the EMA, the TGA here, the FDA, they're all playing this theatre in this application process saying, oh, look at these numbers, and this is for process one, the, the, the dummy and in the in the footnotes on all those applications, they go, oh, but the manufacturer wants to switch to this process. Um, it's only been tested on 250. They just have to follow us, give us follow up data. Uh, they're approved. And when the EMA, TGA didn't bother doing this, but when the EMA subsequently knocked on Pfizer's door and said, uh, can you give us the follow up data on the testing of that, the real process two stuff, the stuff that everyone's received? Mm. Um, on those 250 people, Pfizer had the temerity to turn around and go, it's not relevant now. You guys have rolled it out to billions of people. It doesn't matter what our results say. Uh, like so arrogant. And the EMA said, okay, let's just keep walking. Let's just keep walking. And so the cover up is on both sides. Yeah. Completely, completely irresponsible uh, regulators on all of these issues. And it's all about if no one knows, um, well, then we'll be okay and we can keep yeah. our you know, nearly million dollar a year positions as yeah. the head of the TGA or the MHRA uh, or the EMA. But the cat's out of the bag. This is what these proceedings are all about. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, so we're at a, you know, I, th I think we've been going for about an hour and 17 minutes now. So I think I think we'll probably better w w wind it up there. Um, I have got one question I'm curious about, though. Why the oh, heck? Well, why the oh, heck? Oh, no, sorry, you know, go, go on, go on. I have to answer your question. You said the indemnities provided to oh, yes. the manufacturer. Okay. The indemnities we've outlined to the Director of Public Prosecutions, we believe that they can be taken away in Australia because of all of this false information coming from the manufacturers and their failure to alert us about, for instance, the DNA contamination, which was yeah. easily discoverable and we believe they've always known. Yeah. Now, that's a legal argument. Can these indemnities go away or not? Irrespective of the indemnities against the manufacturers, the government departments are liable anyway. Okay. Now, let's be clear. An indemnity means you can still sue Pfizer and Moderna. And if you win, it just means the government's got to pay. That's the only issue, right? They're not blocked from being sued. It's just who ultimately pays. But if you're going to be suing Pfizer and Moderna about this DNA contamination or the fact that these are GMOs and they weren't declared, you also will be suing your own government ministries like the TGA in this country, the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator in your country, it would be the MHRA. And so don't be scared to sue these people. There's plenty of proper target defendants to go after, particularly because they all knew about this. So and this, returning... this, could, this could apply retrospectively. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, it's often the case that people who are injured from medical products, um, it's because of something that occurred in the past. Yeah. And the, court, the court's fairly and squarely recognize that. And it's it's only subsequently that this knowledge uh, is made known and understood by uh, injured parties. And then they go, oh, crap, I uh, wish I knew that back then, but I didn't, I got injured. Now I want to sue those who led me down this path. And, and, and would action be taken against individual officers within those departments or do they enjoy oh, some sort of vicarious liability? Def no, definitely, definitely. We've been seeking uh, to raise a national class action lawsuit in this country, a proper one. There is one that is underway, but it's very, very narrow, and it doesn't list 
the range, the complete range of defendants um, who are all responsible. And but if yes, it's individuals, you, you can see why they're running scared and trying to cover this up. Of course. Well, it's more than that because it's not just suing a department and saying, oh, this, this office holder was responsible for the decision. In those circumstances, that's sort of suing the government, that department ends up paying when you can show liability. On this occasion, because, and it happened all across the world, because those individuals were out there spruiking marketing effectively on behalf of Pfizer and Moderna, mm. that these things were safe and effective, safe and effective, you get to sue that, that public officer in their personal capacity. That means if liability is shown, in other words, they knew that those statements were false when they were making them to the public, the liability is in the individual, not as the Secretary of Health, it is as Brendan Murphy or whoever the relevant health minister was in your country during 2021. And that yeah. means the bill for that liability has to be paid, is meant to be paid out of the estate of the individual. In other words, the ministry isn't meant to pay it for them. So it's got enormous consequences for, for teaching these people the right lessons. It's like, no, you don't get to get the government purse to pay for your wrongdoing. This is going to involve you having to sell your house, mate, because you intentionally lied to millions of your fellow countrymen. Why did you do it? Because they're getting back-end payments somewhere. They must have been. You don't willingly send people off to slaughter like that unless you've been handsomely rewarded. These things will come out. You know, sometime down the road. The we Ministry shall... of Health in my country at that time was called Matt Hancock. Yeah, oh, what? Well, yeah, we know about Hancock and his He's WhatsApp. He's quite famous for being caught snogging his girlfriend in the uh, in a cupboard somewhere or something when he was supposed to be uh, socially distancing. Oh, yes, right. Yeah, well, nothing applied to Matt. And we no. saw that in his, his no. WhatsApp messages, didn't we? It was all about scaring the public.